Not even vaguely. We're not even looking for interpretation here. It is expressly in Scripture in Matthew 13, 39 to 49. Here's what he writes. Start reading at verse 39, which is where he begins. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. And then he adds an ellipsis. And from there he leaps to verse 49. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Now that's his entire quote that he believes expressly states that the line of demarcation between this age and the age to come is the return of Christ. Except there's no mention of the return of Christ in there. In fact, the very place where he inserted the ellipsis so he could jump to verse 49, what does it say Christ does in verse 41? That's where he adds the ellipsis. He will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. So is the Son of Man returning there? No, what's he doing? He's sending out angels there. So wherever he is, whether he's in heaven or whether he's on earth at that point, this says nothing contextually about the return of Christ. Right? What it says is there's going to be a time of judgment. And that judgment is going to occur by the angels going out and separating wheat and tares. Now let's look at the whole context and let's see if it says anything about the return of Christ. This is Jesus interpreting a parable that he told starting in verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, or weeds. And then he went his way, and when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Well, then where did these tares come from? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt you that we go and gather them up? And he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skip down then to verse 37. Actually, verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom all that offend and them that do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears, let him hear. Then he goes into the parable of the buried treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. Verse 45, he goes into the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls who bought the pearl of great price. Then starting in verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered every kind which when it was full, they drew it to shore. They sat down and gathered the good into the vessel but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and they shall sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. All of that complete passage has one central theme. What's the theme? Judgment. Very good. It's about judgment. It's all about judgment. What about the fact that there are bad people and good people on the earth? And he said, the good and the bad are going to dwell together until the end of the world. But at the end of the world, proper judgment will happen. The bad are going to get their punishment. The good are going to get their reward. That is the theme all the way through that passage. Does it say a word about the return of Christ? No. More importantly, does it state that the return of Christ is the line of demarcation between this age and the age to come? 
only where he says at the end of the world. That's the only thing that he makes reference to the fact that the judgment will take place at the end of the world. And that's it. So now understand that if you're just reading this article and he says this line of demarcation is expressly stated in scripture, people will go, oh, I see. But if you go read the text that he chose to use, there's no such thing in the text. So now, who's right? Either we've got to go with what the text does say, that there is judgment coming at the end of the world, which is stated exactly in Revelation 20. The only difference between what we just read there, which is the supposedly clearer text, and Revelation 20, the more complicated text apparently, is that in Revelation 20 it says that that judgment does happen. The separation of the good and bad, the wheat and tares, the sheep and goats, all of that happens. It's just that the good go into the millennium, are raised up in part of the first resurrection. The second death has no power on them. And after the thousand years of the establishment of the kingdom, the tares, the goats, the evil, the bad, the unjust, those are all raised up and they get their judgment and they are in fact cast into the lake of fire. Just like he said here, gathered up and cast into the furnace. The only difference between them is that John puts that thousand year mark in there. Now it seems to me that John's description is much more clear, concise, and distinct than Matthew's is. Jesus did the same thing that all the Old Testament prophets do in looking forward to coming events. The example that I use so many times is unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Right? Okay, so Jesus came, he was the child, he was the son. Did he take up the reins of government? No. But will he? Sure, you said not yet. But he will. When? Well, we know now that there's at least a couple thousand years in there. And when he comes back, he will take up the reins of government. And where that Isaiah passage is concerned, concerning the child and the son and the government, did the child born and the son given, did that happen literally? Sure. So can you spiritualize the government being upon his shoulders? No. I mean, it all is part and parcel of the same messianic prophecy concerning what Messiah would do on the earth. So Jesus said, at the end of the world, there will be proper judgment. John picks it up and says, and it'll have a thousand years to encompass that whole judgment. Now, there's no problem harmonizing those two. They both complement each other. But very, very importantly, nothing in Matthew 13, Riddlebarger's chosen text, that expressly states that line of demarcation doesn't say anything about this age, the age to come, the line of demarcation, or the return of Christ. And that's his proof text. That's problematic. Now, having read his shortened version of it, where he added the ellipsis and leapt down to verse 49, which is three parables later, he writes, these statements are the type of clear and unambiguous texts mentioned earlier. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. That should be the, the reaction. Hmm. Because he just said we have to let the clear text interpret the less clear text. And Matthew 13, he said, is that kind of clear, unambiguous text that simply doesn't say anything like what I want it to say. But that's the clear one. But that Revelation 21, that's the confusing one. Now he's going to tell us what we can get out of that text. Notice that according to this text, judgment occurs immediately at Christ's return, not after 1,000-year millennium as in the premillennial scheme. Does the text say that? No, it says nothing about Christ's return anywhere in the text, even in the largest context. That's why I read all the context for you. It simply never says what Kim would like it to say. This is not the only line of biblical evidence, however, for in addition to this, we can find other such statements about the coming of Christ that fit very clearly into the two-age model. Clearly. Very clearly, yeah, kind of like that last one. Yeah, yeah this will be good. According to Scripture, Kim goes on to say, the resurrection of both the just and the unjust occurs simultaneously. Jesus expressly states that he will raise believers up on the last day. And then he cites John 6.39, John 6.40, John 6.44, John 6.54, and John 11.24. I'll save you the time. In every one of those passages, he's talking about those that he...